Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to the Cato Institute. Uh, my name is Jonathan Blanks. I'm with our project on criminal justice. And it is my honor today to host a book forum with Khalil Gibran, Gibran Muhammad and his wonderful book, Condemnation of Blackness. Uh, we're going to talk about a sensitive subject today. Uh, it's the, the American racial discourse. We're going to talk about persistent ideas, prejudices, prejudices, and myths that have and continue to drive prejudicial, prejudicial thinking in this country. Um, besides my love for the book that we're discussing today, I was motivated to have this discussion because as a country and as individuals, we really need to rethink how we think about race and what that means for today's culture. Um, so much of American life is perme still permeated by racism and our institutions, particularly our criminal justice system, are still permeated by it. And so it's, this is going to be a racial dialogue that may make some people uncomfortable, but I think it's absolutely essential for moving forward as a country. Back in 2015, I gave a testimony before the US Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, the, idea, the topic of, for discussion was uh, reducing police violence. And while I was there, uh, a colleague from the Manhattan Institute named Heather McDonald also gave testimony. And I want to uh, read her opening remarks for you. Any shooting of an unarmed civilian is a tragedy. The police should constantly refine their tactics so that such mistakes never happen. Moreover, the police have an indefeasible obligation to treat everyone with courtesy and respect and within the confines of the law. But while we need to make sure police are properly trained in the Constitution and courtesy, there is a larger reality between policing and race that remains a taboo topic, and that is black on black crime. Um, in a hearing that was meant to talk about the processes and policies that police implement to, uh, that lead to violence, uh, Ms. McDonald used her testimony to talk about how violent black people are. She couched her critique in uh, the eyes of, in the uh, guise of black victimhood. She talked about those who, uh, the silent, like sort of the, the silent black people who weren't, who were being victimized by, by black crime and how that, how they must have felt. And uh, so she was, she was couching her, her, uh, her talk in empathy. But what she was saying is not at all new. Uh, I don't pretend to know her motivations and I'm not calling her a racist. But her comments are of a piece of a long history of social commentary uh, and commentators who, across a long stre stretch of history with motivations both good and ill, uh, focus on black criminality as the core problem facing American public policy and American uh, race relations. Indeed, as the book we're here to describe today explains, the idea and focus on black criminality has long been a salient feature of American culture. And if I may quote from it, since the 1980s, disproportionately high crime rates among blacks has been the starting point and linchpin of modern discourse on black criminality. Neither racial liberals nor conservatives escape that statistical reality. In the world of numbers, stripped of context, all black people were more likely to commit, uh, all black people were more likely to commit crimes against property and personhood. But context was everything for those writing in defense of blacks' humanity. And here to explain that context is Khalil Gibran Muhammad. Khalil Gibran Muhammad is a professor of history and race and public policy at Harvard Kennedy School and the Suzanne Young uh, Murray Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. He is the former director of the Schomburg Center for, for Research in Black Culture in New York City, a uh, division of the New York Public Library, and the world's leading library and archive on global black history. Before, leading the Schomburg, before leaving the Schomburg Center, he was an associate professor at Indiana University, my alma mater. Uh, Khalil's scholarship examines the broad inter intersections of race, democracy, and inequality in the American criminal justice system in modern U.S. history. He is co-editor of Constructing the Carceral State, a special issue in the Journal of American History, and a contributor to a 2014 National Research Council study, The Growth of Incarceration in the United States, Exploring Causes and Consequences. Of course, he is the author of the book we're going to talk about today, The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America, which was available for sale outside. Uh, which won the John, 2011 John Hope Franklin Best Book Award in American Studies. Much of his work has been featured in national print and broadcast media outlets, including the New York Times, the New Yorker, Washington Post, to name a few. And I highly recommend his contribution to the 1619 Project on Big Sugar. Um, a native of Chicago Southside, Khalil graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a BA in economics in 1993. He earned his PhD in US history from Rutgers University. Please welcome Khalil Gibran Muhammad. Got some fans here. Yeah. 
I do have some family, you know, family from uh, I have high school friends here and a college friend and a colleague, Victor. So. Awesome. So, um, oh, by the way, for those who are watching online or people who are in the audience who want to uh, follow along on Twitter, use the hashtag CatoCJ. Um, so, what prompted you to write this book? So, I grew up in uh, at really the height of the uh, wars on crime and drug in the 1980s and 90s. And although I didn't understand it in that context, I do distinctly recall uh, my father lived uh, in Harlem uh, beginning in 1990 and uh, regularly walked across crack vials um, at that time. Uh, but it wasn't the evidence of uh, the epidemic of drug addiction and drug use in, in that particular black community or the graffiti covered subway cars, um, or even the proliferation of cop shows, like cops um, on uh, what was a new genre of television, um, reality TV at the time. It was uh, the case of the beating of Rodney King uh, in 1991 when I was at Penn. Uh, and it was that moment when I realized that for, 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 for all that we will talk about with regard to the complexities of of violence in the black community um, and policing more generally, um, this just looked like a total miscarriage of justice. Um, it was the first time that police violence had been caught on video, partly because uh, handheld, handheld video was becoming a consumer item. It became viral, and it fundamentally changed uh, the nature of the conversation around policing. Not all for the good. Uh, but it did change in that moment, and it created two things. It created young people like me, who I consider uh, my Michael Brown Ferguson moment, and I say that with all the loaded context in which it implies we don't all agree about what happened in Ferguson, for example. Uh, but for me, it was, a, it was that kind of moment. Um, and, but for others, like Daryl Gates in Los Angeles, it was a moment that led to further uh, militarization of the Los Angeles Police Department. So I attribute my interest in the topic from that moment uh, and then decided, uh, and this is going to sound almost too contrived, but it is absolutely true that when I decided to go to grad school, which was, uh, I, I matriculated in the fall of 1995, O.J. Simpson was on trial. And so you couldn't ask for two more signal moments and my coming of age story between being in college and starting graduate school, between being 18 and being 22, uh, that opened up this really big question. And th that big question was, how do we explain how we got here? And in my search for answering that question as a, as a new graduate student, it seemed to me it was not just about what had happened in the South uh, after slavery. And so that's how I came to the topic. Excellent. Um, and as this leads back right into my next question, so when we do think, when Americans tend to think about slavery, it's like we were always taught it's like it's, it's slavery was a southern, was a southern issue, and even grow, growing up in Indiana, roughly the same time as Khalil grew up in Chicago, you know, we looked, I mean, honestly, just admitting a prejudice, looked at the South as racist and backwards, you know, that this was, this was their problem. Keep in mind, during my, you know, my, my youth, School desegregation was a hot button topic from the time I, as far back as I can remember, until the time I graduated high school in Indiana. Jim Crow was never there, in theory, right? And so your book focuses mostly on uh, three northern cities, uh, Chicago, New York, and Philly, during like what you call the long Jim Crow period up through the progressive era. Um, and the, the book is meticulously researched. Um, I think there's like 85 pages of footnotes. 92. 92. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and it's great, but it's very, very readable. Uh, I highly, highly enjoy it. When I had an opportunity to hold a book event when it was re-released with a new preface, I jumped at the chance. Like, I didn't wait an hour before I <laughs> reached out to him. So, but there is, there, there is no simple story in this. It, it's, um, our, our tales of racism tend to operate on some sort of like um, a dual thing. There's like a, a a racist bad guy like Bull Connor on one side, and then there's some you know, hero on the other side, which is like Martin Luther King or something along those lines. And yet, this is a very complex tale uh, of people who are operating with good intentions, but don't always come to the right conclusions, people who are obviously operating in bad intentions. And so 
I think the, the crucial moment that starts in your book is the census of 1890. Uh, can you explain why that's so crucial? Sure. Well, uh, if, if we just think about in our own minds um, how many people who are African American, for example, in our criminal justice system, most of you have some idea. Like, you may not actually have the right number, and I'm not here to test you. But you've been exposed to uh, this kind of lingua franca of black criminality and the way that we talk about the numbers of young black people who are likely to go to prison in the course of their lifetime, or even local arrest statistics, or rising or decreasing crime rates. And one of the things that this book uh, describes in, in, it is an origin story. We have access to this information uh, today, uh, but it wasn't always the case. Um, there was a moment when uh, the state, uh, both local, state, and federal, decided, like, this is important for us to know, and important for us to know in ways that was not neutral, and that's what's so important about the history. Uh, we wanted to know this information because in the late 19th century, demographers and social scientists were deeply concerned and anxious about which groups of Americans and newcomers, immigrants, mostly from Europe, were worthy of a full participation in American life. Uh, which should we keep a, an extra eye on? Uh, which should be segregated? Um, which should be kept in the South? Uh, all these kinds of questions filled the pages of journalistic, social science, um, uh, reporting, and, and, and literature. And as such, crime statistics emerges by the late 19th century as one of the most salient and important data points, what I call the first era of a big data revolution or a racial data revolution, uh, that comes to define, in many ways, how we talk about black people's capacity for self-governance. Uh, and again, it wasn't true in slavery, because black people uh, were enslaved, 90% of the population, uh, by 1860. And also wasn't true in the sense, the legal sense, that most of the black population could not be criminals in the formal sense, because they had no legal standing. They were property. And so first you needed freedom. Then you needed a context in which crime statistics made sense as a way of measuring black lives. So what I'm trying to say uh, is that it wasn't just about black people. The late 19th century was also the era of the emergence of American eugenics movement. Uh, and so there's the establishment of laboratories in, in Long Island. There's a great thought. Even the IQ test emerges by the early 20th century as one expression of this. We start to sterilize and incapacitate. And uh, so this is, you know, really big moment where these kinds of statistics are really important. And so how many Irish criminals there are, Italian criminals, really wasn't that these were great people. It was just like, well, let's rank them and figure out who we should deal with first. <laughs> and black folks were largely Southern at that time. So a lot of the energy around this in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia, for example, was not directed at black people. It was directed at uh, European, Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Um, even Jews uh, gave much anxiety uh, in New York City, for example, starting um, a very specific reformatory so that the Jewish crime problem wouldn't, wouldn't embarrass the Jewish race in the early 20th century. So crime statistics by 1890 um, are, for the first time, a major data point for a national conversation about a black crime problem. Prior to that, it just doesn't exist. It is national. It is animating subfields of research, and it becomes part of a political project that in the end will make legitimate legalized segregation in the South and de, de, de facto or customary segregation in the North. Um, you can't understand the emergence of Plessy versus Ferguson and the wide scale mistreatment and discrimination that blacks face, not even talking about within the criminal justice system, without understanding the importance of the 1890 census. So what did it tell us? It tells us a lot of things, but in particular, it told us that there were uh, 82,000 prisoners in the United States, and that of that number, roughly 22,000 were African American. African Americans represented about 12% of the population and were 30% of the nation's prisoners. And so they were almost three times overrepresented in the nation's prisons. Uh, and as such, this became the smoking gun of the 
first generation after slavery for proving that black people were pathological. Quick context for why that mattered, separate and apart from the demographic changes and eugenics and social science, it mattered because the abolitionist arguments that black people were really just white people in dark skin, um, which many of them felt genuinely, or that there was only one species of humanity that God had made and that there was no distinction to be made, those arguments did not win the Civil War. The Union Army did. And so people continue to debate the origins of, of blackness. They continue to debate um, the relationship of Africa to the presence of black people in America, so much so that there were volumes and volumes of academic literature that essentially argued that without the beneficent hand of American slaveholders, black people will revert to their quote unquote ancestral condition of barbarism uh, and we would be left suffering the consequences. So the search for an answer to this debate to resolve what essentially remained a northern ideological contest over, well, black people really are just inferior by virtue of slavery and we're going to help them up versus black people are doomed uh, to be primitive and barbaric and destroy America. People were just debating it. And so what happens is, by 1890, with these crime statistics, it kind of solves the debate. Northerners back off and say, well, wait a minute. Like, you know, because it turns out there's greater crime rates in the North than there is in the South. And so they start to look at their own place and they say, well, if they're committing crimes here, and Southerners were like applauding. They were like, yes, now you see the problem. Um, so if we can see greater disparities in northern cities as compared to southern ones, then it can't be white people. It has to be black people. It has to be uh, something pathological about them. And there's a lot to say about you know, the kind of intellectual infrastructure that supported those ideas. But that sense has set our common understanding, our common language, the range of arguments that we make across the political divide from you know, every ideological spectrum, from libertarian to liberal to conservative, we're having the same arguments and same debate as they started having in 1890. Absolutely. Uh, I wanted to talk about one of the, uh, the academics that like, kind of led to this, uh, the Frederick Hoffman and his race traits book. Um, you, uh, you put it very well. Is like you said that he helped write crime into race. Like, um, is, could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. The, the, the point is there's nothing natural about any of this. Right. Uh, it's not obvious that, uh, that we would make criminality a measure of humanity. And that's why it's so important to understand the context, because that's why we did it. Yeah. Um, because we wanted to sort humanity. We, we needed to know who was better and who wasn't. Um, and so I needed Hoffman's story to um, be an anchor for the book, because he's the first person to make sense of this number. He gave us the framework that other people responded to. And it turns out his version of how to understand the 1890 data is the one that stuck in terms of our, in terms of how we understand what came next and also kind of the dominant frames. I mean, we could argue today, those frames are shifting. You're here, we're at Cato, you know, there's yeah. a lot of possibilities in play. <laughs> uh, but really for most of the 20th century, Hoffman won. His way of understanding what that number meant. And what he said, essentially, he, it's a quick background. Hoffman was a German immigrant, came to the United States in 1884, penniless, without connections. He had a real knack for numbers um, and quickly became one of the nation's leading actuarials. He actually is singularly responsible for, for collecting and recording homicide data in the United States before the federal government did so. Uh, and by 1940, he's being held by in every statistical professional society as the dean of American statistics. He spent much of his career at Prudential Insurance working uh, in the commercial and private sector as an actuarial. Uh, but what he did in 1896, which was shortly after he started at Prudential and about a decade after he came to the United States with no connections whatsoever, is remarkable as a single accomplishment. And uh, I mean, if we could build a monument to the person who gave us this legacy of the criminalization of race in America, he would be on the mall. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but of course, he, he did have some pushback. He did, he, he did end up winning, but he had some pushback. And I think of Ida B. Wells being, became among them. Obviously, she 
She fought the narrative that was around lynching at the time. Um, and to me, it seems very, it parallels to stuff that goes on today. So um, you, you think of the way that we talk about, say, police shootings. Mike Brown, as he, he mentioned earlier, he was no angel, we've been told. And sure enough, he, he, he committed some crimes. But, you know, that became a justification for what happened to him. And with, and if, you, I don't, if you want to talk a little bit more about uh, Ida's work, but that was something that where she expressed that. She had come to um, anti-lynching activism because of something that happened in her life. Sure. Yeah, so Ida B. Wells, uh, I think a fair number of you know about Ida B. Wells, but she's still, you know, she's still being having a renaissance and being taught for the first time in schools. But uh, she was a journalist in Memphis, and um, one of these child prodigies, uh, progeny, progeny, what's the word? Prodigy. I've been up for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and she, uh, she was exceptional, very talented uh, woman. So she establishes her own printing press, and it uh, turns out that what made her famous in town was not her great journalism, but the fact that three of her friends uh, had run a successful grocery store in Memphis and were threatened by uh, local whites that uh, their business was too successful and you know, they should quit it. Uh, they chose not to, and they were killed in a triple lynching. She reported on it, and uh, in the, um, literally while the embers of her friend's death uh, and the, their actual business uh, were still smoldering, uh, her printing press was burned to the ground, and basically she was run out of town. And I know Jim Lowen is here, uh, author of Sundown Town, so he's asleep already. That's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so he, the, uh, she, she was a victim of a, of a kind of sundown moment by being run out. Of, talk about Ida B. Wells uh, being run out of Memphis in 1884. So, uh, so that set her on a path uh, to expose what by then had already started to become a narrative. Um, and Hoffman is guilty of this himself. So hear me out. Every episode of lynching that Ida B. Wells turned into a national disgrace. She actually traveled uh, to, to, to England um, and gave lectures about the savagery of America. Now we can split this a couple of different ways, but probably the most, uh, the, the broadest general acceptance of what she was doing in terms of her argument was, was simply this, that in a nation of laws, we don't string people up on trees or set wood on fire and throw their bodies or chop them up and sell body parts as souvenirs. So we don't even have to have the conversation about guilt or innocence to recognize that the strength of her argument was predicated on our hypocrisy as a nation of laws. And that was, uh, so she of course also made an innocence claim uh, for those that she could prove were innocents. But what she did, like the Washington Post and the Guardian today, this is a really interesting parallel. Um, so we know, even to this moment, that there is no um, national census taking of police shootings um, or deaths of unarmed people. Uh, and this became a big issue in the context of uh, the response to Ferguson and the emergence of Black Lives Matter activism. Uh, so the Washington Post and the Guardian have been reporting now since that moment uh, annual rates uh, of police killings, the aggregate number, which generally is around 1,000. Well, Ida B. Wells was the first person to take on the lynching moment by saying, I'm going to look at what the murderers, those who lynched people, actually said was the reason they murdered this person or lynched this person. Because Hoffman, when he writes about uh, lynching in his book, his 1896 books, which created uh, the framework I've already talked about, he said that every lynching statistic was evidence of black rape or murder of a white person. He actually said, I, I'm adding something, he said of rape. He made a singular argument. So a lynching was not evidence of vigilante justice or white savagery on display in a nation of laws. It was uh, an appropriate response to a black rape of a white woman. And he actually didn't have the evidence for it uh, because it was part of a belief system that had been in place at that time. So he was engaging in something that didn't even meet his own, uh, his own academic standards. Anyway, Ida B. Wells looked at the Chicago Tribune over uh, a three-year period, and she recorded, she looked at every recorded instance of a lynching, and what she found was that only 31% of all lynchings were attributed to rape. The next highest category was of murder, 
and then there are other crimes that were identified. But murder is complicated. So let's just take the rape myth uh, at face value. Um, on one hand, in our Me Too era, we might listen to those white women more um, if we were to go back in time from our present standpoint. But we also know that, uh, that consensual interracial relationship between black men and white women were not acceptable. And in cases when those were discovered, a white woman, instead of admitting to it, often lied. So we'll, we'll never know the truth of how many of those rapes there were. But the second version of this um, is that murder was often attributed to black men who were defending themselves against white vigilantism or defending themselves against being cheated when they were settling up uh, their sharecropping contract. And you know, like something you know, goes something like this, like, hey, man, you know, there's more uh, cotton bales than what you're giving me credit for. No, it isn't. Well, no. And then well, what are you going to do about it? And so black man wins the fight and later gets lynched. So I'm simplifying and making glib. But essentially, it's a really complicated reality as to what underlies uh, the lynching phenomenon or the aggregate numbers of black crime. So Ida B. Wells exposed the myth, the race rape myth, by looking at how white newspapers, including the Chicago Dream, looked at this. And she came to a conclusion that fundamentally, um, the crime myth was itself not just a southern problem, it was a northern problem because by the time she left Mich uh, Memphis, she was in Chicago, and she recognized that white northerners were taken with how white southerners were explaining the crime problem. I'll tell a quick story, and then I'll let you get to the next question. So she's at a fundraising dinner in 1906 at the Palmer House in Chicago, same hotel that exists today. How many people have been to the Palmer House? Lots of you. Of course, in this crowd, that would be true. So um, she's at a dinner, and she's, she's hearing someone talk about the Atlanta race riot, which occurred in 1906, uh, uh, essentially a, a racial pogrom, an attack on the very successful black um, professional community, including the HBCUs of Morris Brown, Spelman, et cetera. Uh, it was all a form of race baiting in the midst of a gubernatorial election. It's like, who's going to keep the N-word in their place better than the other guy? Uh, and so an allegation of rape leads to a wholesale violence against the black community. Uh, several people die. OK, so now the story is national news. Here we are in Chicago at a fundraising dinner. And a, a, a liberal white man is talking about the race riot. And a woman says to um, Ida B. Wells, who's a, her dinner guest, so this woman happened to be a suffragist and a local organizer of settlement houses, she says to her, I don't know what to make of what happened in that Atlanta race riot. But what I do know is that African Americans commit uh, three 3% of all the crimes here in Chicago. And now she didn't say this, but parenthetically, I know the number is 10%. Um, uh, I'm sorry, three, did you say 3%? 10% so of all the crimes in Chicago, and the number in the population was 3%. So this was, this was literally a black on black crime moment. Uh, and Ida B. Wiles recognized it as such. In other words, I don't know what happened to all those black people killed in Atlanta. But as far as I'm concerned, if they have a crime problem in Atlanta, like they do in Chicago, where African Americans are overrepresented in the arrest statistics, then I can't say that it wasn't justified. And Ida B. Wells literally, uh, you know, hand to the face and severed her relationship with this woman. And I, you know, she tells this in her autobiography. She's pissed off about it in the same way that some people would be pissed off today if you said, well, so-and-so deserved to die at the hands of a police officer because there's a lot of crime in that community. Um, so that's the Ida B. Wells story. And she, you know, she didn't uh, rest on her laurels. She fought until 1931 to her deathbed. Uh, there's a monument going up to her in Chicago right now. Um, so it's a big deal. Yeah, she, she was absolutely great. Um, there's also pushing back at the same time uh, was W.E.B. Du Bois and his, um, his work in Philadelphia. Um, can you talk a little bit about both his work sort of as counter to the uh, Hoffman thesis, and also some of the, the troubles in, um, you know, sort of how he framed the, the issues within the black community, what you can call like basically the talented tenth versus the submerged tenth. Yeah. So Du Bois is incredible. And, and I, I spent a little bit more time on these than probably Jonathan wants, because I'm telling you are present in these past stories. Uh, and on purpose. Um, so we address some of these questions as they come up. So the first thing that the, why Du Bois is important is because Du Bois is the first person who, he first has a PhD uh, from uh, Harvard. Uh, he's a trained social scientist. He, he 
goes to Germany for a period of time, uh, learns from Max Weber. Um, by any standard, today or then, uh, he's one of the best educated emerging sociologists. He really would be considered a historical sociologist in, in the country, period, hands down, and some of the best training. So Du Bois takes on Hoffman directly. I mean, just to legitimize that Hoffman isn't just a figment of my imagination as an important person. He writes an article in 1898 called The Study of the Negro Problems. And he makes a reference to Hoffman as a foreigner doing drive-by sociology. <laughs> he basically says, look, you can't just look at a general census and make a determination about the sociological condition of a people. You have to spend time with those people. You have to understand their, their culture, their ways, the, 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 the political economy of the community that they operate in. Uh, and so that was, that, was one of, that was essentially Du Bois's opening salvo on what became an enduring um, set of counter-arguments about the criminalization of African Americans. The next is that, and this is another myth buster, um, the myth buster is that Du Bois concedes all of the ground to opposing viewpoints that black people did in fact have a crime problem. So the extent to which we hear the constant refrain, why are we talking about police? We never talk about the crime in the black community. Well, from the very beginning, when Hoffman is writing and Du Bois is taking it on, Du Bois starts the conversation by saying, there's more to it than he's saying, but yes, we have a crime problem. And so he offers, this is his solution, back in 1899 when he publishes The Philadelphia Negro. His solution is, first, black people need to get their crime problem together. Second, white people need to get their racism problem together. But he gets ignored. And it's, a, it's amazing to see. Because essentially, any acknowledgment of structural racism and bigotry in America was unacceptable to the sociological community. And what he gets accused of is coddling his own, his own criminals, uh, having a literal chip on his shoulder uh, for, as one sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania says of him, for a man with such accomplishments, you think he'd know better. He just has a chip on his shoulder. Essentially, like, why should he be angry? His own success and opportunity is evidence that there's no racism problem in America. Have we heard that before? Mm -hmm. so, so Du Bois tries rhetorically to concede the crime problem, not because he wants to pathologize black people, but because it makes sense to him. And it makes sense to him because by 1899, when he writes this book, African Americans are literally suffering from huge disadvantages, what we today would call concentrated poverty, but also because they're struggling to essentially adopt the bourgeois norms that Du Bois himself had been raised or reared in growing up in Great Barrington, Massachusetts and going to college for an undergrad and then PhD. So he brought his own kind of Victorian sensibility of the late 19th century and said, yeah, you know, there's too much sex, there's too much violence, um, and uh, people need to, to, to pull themselves up. They need to do better. In this way, he and Booker T. Washington were very much aligned in those early days. Uh, but he wasn't taken seriously. And I'll, the last point I'll say, because I'm, I'm sure you have questions to refine the answer, and I'm giving away everything, um, is that Du Bois's critique of criminalization was rooted in a structural argument that was already becoming the dominant argument amongst white sociologists around immigrants. So if the eugenics era brought into existence conversations about closing the borders and sterilization and the use of crime statistics to say the Irish were unworthy, sociologists came into existence saying, no, quite the contrary. The Irish are Europeans just like the rest of us, and they're suffering from inequality, from a class-based oppression, and from nativism and xenophobic, and from segregation, and we need to help these people. So Du Bois looks around at his colleagues and he says, well, I'll be. <laughs> Doesn't the same thing apply to African Americans? And so his argument was not to shy away from the criminality, but to say that black people's crime problem is no different than Irish people's crime problem, except they deal with a slightly more virulent form of racism. So his argument was, the, prob the way to explain the real crime is industrializations, grinding forces, plus racism. True for the Irish, true for black folks. Um, and it does right, lead right into my next question. So 
Um, one of the things that Ida B. Wells wrote about later in her life was she, I think she called it the, um, the like three pronged, well, she didn't call it this, but like there are three issues that she was fi fighting labor discrimination, crime stigma, and um, problems with the welfare agencies. Mm -hmm. um, if, like, traditional libertarian dogma says we don't need a, you know, a government welfare system because private philanthropy will take care of it. Um, what is the history of uh, private philanthropy uh, in, in the United States, both talking about the white immigrants and the black migrants? Yeah, that is a really good question in this context. Uh, so before the New Deal, before you know, people's heads exploded, right? <laughs> in the context of the big state, um, the progressive era sets in motion the possibility, essentially, for a more vigorous state to address various forms of inequalities in a regulatory state. We know that that story, but even before the federal government really gets into the welfare state, you know, it, I mean, there are state-based charities. Um, so not the feds, but at the state and local level. Um, so there are already public-private partnerships um, with uh, local charity societies, et cetera. But this is the era of the emergence of the settlement house. These are the local community institutions that are the uh, mediating institutions between absolute destitution um, and some kind of um, pro-social intervention that will help people, largely poor white people, um, feed themselves, learn better hygiene, and have access to job training and opportunity. You know, kind of stuff we, we still do within the context of direct social service. And a lot of this was philanthropically uh, funded. Almost all of it was philanthropically funded. So black people face two problems. And, and I'm talking now about northern cities. The first problem they faced is that these organizations uh, were largely segregated. They either excluded black people altogether in favor of people who didn't speak English. And I don't mean that to be nativist, I mean literally uh, black people's Americanness uh, was less important uh, than a non-English speaking Italian immigrant's whiteness was. And so they focused on uh, European descendant people first and foremost, uh, excluded African Americans, and if they did allow African Americans in their doors, they usually did it on a part-time basis, uh, like Black Sundays. Um, or they had special programs set aside to do certain specific things. But you can imagine, in the midst of great poverty, in the midst of great slums that you know, animated um, tremendous academic literature, journalistic treatments, the dangerous classes. I mean, if you read some of the um, Little Five, um, what, why am I missing? What's the, the, the slum on the Lower East Side? Five Gang, what's the district called? Oh, uh, five, points, five Points, right, yeah. Little Five Points. This kind of uh, pulp fiction, uh, poverty porn uh, of that day was largely about white people. Um, and it was horrible to those people and maligned them categorically. And so these organizations stepped in you know, to both say, no, these people are worthy of our help and attention and charity, and, uh, and they're good people. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't do the same for black. That was the first problem that black people face. Uh, the second problem that, that black people faced is when philanthropists did say, OK, you can't come to this settlement house, but we'll help you build your own. They then said to them, but you have to match us dollar for dollar, or you have to get a two to one match or a three to one match. But if we have wealth inequality today, you know, <laughs> you, you, if black people make about you know, $5,000 and have about $5,000 in, in, in wealth, uh, some estimates are down to 1,000. Some say it'll be zero soon as compared to $100,000. Imagine what it was like in 1900, the turn of the 20th century. So all the money was in the hands of somebody European descendant. And so you couldn't say to black people, you need to build your own settlement houses and expect the same outcome. And so black people did the best that they could. Ida B. Wells literally spent decades trying. That white woman who insulted her in that meeting was a philanthropist uh, that she had to sever ties with because she had to draw the line around her principles. So the basic infrastructure that was built to address what I'm going to now call white criminality in the early 20th century, which was understood to be rooted in in a capitalist economy that was fundamentally unfair, of which the crime statistics were read as symptomatic of a, of a system, of, of an economic system, became an invitation to tell black people, number one, your crime problem is rooted in your racial heritage and your culture. Number two, you're not welcome here. And number three, um, if you are able to support your own settlement house, then you'll be able to rise up like the rest of us. 
And that's how it got started yeah. with this notion of, you know, black people need to figure this out on their own. And it, it just, it, it strikes me so similar when you think about what, when people looked at the same group of people, well, the two groups of people, the European immigrants and the black migrants from the South, from the Great Migration, one was like, we look at it with such care and thought, like, oh, we really need to take care of these people. And the other people were like, well, that's just how they are. And if you fast forward to the, rest, to the later part of the 20th century, when we were growing up, we remember the crack epidemic and how the, the uh, response to uh, you know, people with terrible drug addictions, living in poverty very often, uh, was punitive. We're going to throw people in prison. But now uh, the rhetoric around the opioid crisis is a lot different because people are starting to realize, oh, well, that, that's my cousin who like, got addicted with pain pills or whatever. And it's just like the, these, these problems that we're talking about continue to echo today because when something is conceived to be a black problem, it is a problem with black people. When it's something is considered to be a white problem, it is our problem. It is everyone's problem. It is society's problem to fix. I like to say, just to echo your point, white people are too big to fail or too big to jail. Like, right, you know, like if that many white people are doing something wrong, we can't put them all in jail, uh, so we got to fix something. We, we can literally try to put all the black people in jail or all the native people or indigenous people on reservations. So it, my, my day job, but most of what I work on is policing. And so I, I look at policing policy and how p police policy works against both um, public safety issue, public safety concerns, but also what police want, police safety concerns, and what they're actually trying to do. Um, I was absolutely struck by your, the origin story of the Philadelphia Vice Commission, uh, and I would hope you could uh, elaborate a little bit for the audience. Yeah, so, the, uh, so there's, there's two moments in Philadelphia, the first and the second. The first moment is that, um, so I tell this story of an African-American um, reformer who is a black guy named James Simmons. He's a postal worker, but he's got a brilliant mind, and he has great aspirations to be a race leader. He thinks of himself as the equivalent of Du Bois and others, uh, and actually speaks at the first NAACP organizing conference, the one in 1909 that would lead to the establishment of the organization. And basically, he has figured out how to take Du Bois's critique a decade before and to instrumentalize it, to bring it to life. And so he founds a two-pronged organization. One's called the uh, Association for Equalizing Industrial Opportunities, AEIO, and the other is the Joint League for Civic and Political Reform. The Joint League for Civil and Political Reform was a all black people, hands on deck, let's root out the criminals in our community. The AEIO was white people, please give those of us who are respectable and hardworking an opportunity to get a good, decent job and to live our own American dream. This is what Du Bois had written in the Philadelphia Negro. The first solution was black people to fix their crime problem, and the second solution was white people to fix their racism problem. So this is, this is as close as we're going to get to somebody within a decade, right? Going back to like, why aren't black people working on these problems? Why don't black people fix this? We, this is a black people problem. Here we have a black guy trying to do it. So he's organizing. He's giving speeches all over Philadelphia. He's speaking on national platforms. He's publishing national uh, books. He has his own. I mean, it's incredible. You know what comes of this? He gets to a group of people together, of uh, concerned citizens, white and black. The president of Temple University is among this delegation, holds a two-day conference, goes to the mayor of Philadelphia, and he says, Mayor, Blanken uh, mayor Blankenberg, uh, black people commit too much crime in this city. We need your help. The mayor says, hmm. But also, there's a lot of discrimination in the city, and we have good white people who are going to going to help solve this crime problem as we clean up our community and make sure that people who want a good job get a decent job in this city. What comes to this meeting, uh, what the mayor actually says, I don't know. What the newspapers report the next day, and what Stimmons complains about in a letter to his sister, this is how I know these things, um, is that the mayor dwelt on the side of the crime in the community, and that's what the papers reported on. No one paid attention to the whole idea. In other words, that you know, we're going to deal with our crime, but you're going to open up opportunity for us. And then, within months, the mayor announces a massive crackdown on crime, a vice commission, that has the intended and deliberate approach of saving white communities from the crime inside of them, and then redirecting white vice and crime into the black community as a protected red light district that was already inhabited. So black people actually lost twofold. 
They lost on the front of not actually getting the support of the city to help deal with their crime problem and a new economic vision of opportunity. But then they had to take on white people's crime, prostitution, drug dealing, et cetera, et cetera. And that really leads to the second one, which occurs in the 1920s in the midst of the Prohibition era. And there's you know, massive corruption. The city hires vice um, agents, one of whom is a black woman who I write about, who's going around all these places posing as a prostitute. And what she basically sees is what you know from a uh, Francis Ford Coppola movie or a Martin Scorsese movie, which is that there are a lot of corrupt white officials who are, have their hands deep inside of these vice um, businesses. Um, historians estimate something like 80 to 90 percent of the vice in the black community was owned by whites and outsiders. And yet, black people are the ones who are being rounded up in raid after raid after raid. And so, of course, their arrest statistics are going through the roof. And then this is contributing not just in Philadelphia, Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago. Every major city that has this happen in this time period con contributes to the ballooning, ballooning arrest rates of the black population. And that doesn't get read with an asterisk or a footnote. That gets read as, see, I told you these people have a crime problem. So um, going back to like, the, the idea of vice, that became um, federalized in 1910 with the Mann Act, which had another name. Yes, White Slave Traffic Act. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Of which no black woman that we know to this day has been uh, the victim that led to a prosecution uh, of someone. Yeah, so uh, just, you know, putting, that, putting a bullet in, I mean, a, a pin in that, that this is something that, um, again, it is just one of those, if, it, if it's happening to a white person, or if it's happening to the white community, it becomes this, uh, this, moral, this moral crusade that we need to save. But if prostitution is really this horrible evil that is afflicting a community, um, the enforcement is, is always punitive. Um, so we come to a point in, in history where uh, they, we, we used to, in the early days, you would break out like the Irish crime rate, the Italian crime rate. But then the uniform crime reports came. And uh, if you could talk a little bit about Yeah, very quickly, because I know we're running, uh, we're running out of time. So, um, so I could ask it rhetorically, how many Irish Americans committed burglary last quarter, according to the UCRs? Or Italian Americans? Or Polish Americans? Or Jewish Americans? You get the point, right? We don't know. Did they commit crime? Did some Irish American somewhere in America commit a crime? Absolutely. Every, every group that we once would have identified in early crime reporting and annual reports when, and I've seen them, I've looked at local police data, you literally fold it out like an Excel spreadsheet, the pages, because it's all in a, a book, and the pages get folded back onto each other so the book can close. But you open it out, and you have every nationality that was identifiable within the American census um, triangulated across offense categories uh, and how many crimes were recorded in any particular time period. Um, so you would think, like, if crime rates are important in our society as a measure of the health of our society or which people should have access to what or how we should deal with them, then we would still have those, that data. But in fact, we don't. Because when the Uniform Crime Reports becomes the standard measure and standardizes all local agencies, now 18,000 police agencies report to, the, the, to create the Uniform Crime Report, um, they collapsed all those European groups into white, foreign-born, and then the non-whites were Negro, Indian, Mexican, other. And so what happens is in the first couple of years of the Uniform Crime Reports, there's a, a statement that says, to understand the importance of these numbers, you should focus on the foreign-born and the Negro. This is their way of saying, like, the disproportionate criminal activity of those particular groups is what is important in this report. Um, by 1940, that completely goes away, and all you get is white, Negro, and then the other categories, um, and there's no disclaimer. So what that means for us is the statistical gaze of criminality that was much wider narrows, the lens narrows, and all those Italian Americans and Irish Americans, no matter what they're doing, are now collapsed to a singular category of white, which becomes the baseline or norm or benchmark for me measuring everyone else's pathologies. And so you simply can't stigmatize the Italian any longer. I mean, the mob you know, manages a way to do this um, by the 1950s in, in Senate investigations, uh, but it's much harder 
Um, and I call this statistical white flight. I mean, what else is it? Um, because statistics by then rec were recognized as a key weapon in justifying various forms of discrimination and inequality. So you could no longer, and the sociologists are, are, are deeply committed to this project. They, they see this as a massive victory. They want this to happen because they wanted to push back against the eugenicists. They just weren't committed to it for black folk. So um, going back to something you said earlier, uh, you were talking about how the Washington Post had collected the data for how many how many people were shot by cops every year. And uh, it's funny, there was actually federal data on this. Uh, so working in criminal justice and, uh, as, as, a, uh, as a career, I'm, I'm always looking for data. But it's, you know, it, it comes and goes as far, as far as like quality, right? The best federal government data that they had on how many people they killed a year was 400. As, as, as Khalil said, it's 1,000. We were off by more than we knew that that happened. And it's just, just absolutely stunning to me that this is something that the most, should be the, the most fundamental count that we could have in this country when it comes to criminal justice. You're counting bodies. And we were off by more than we knew. And so when you start thinking about the other violence, the other misconduct, the other things that police do that we don't know and we have no way of knowing is all hidden behind, uh, behind the blue wall of silence, the, the, the sort of America that the police uh, keep against each other. And it, that is where the Black Lives Matter argument comes from. If you look at the Campaign Zero website, for example, it is a whole bunch of policies trying to change the way police do business, trying to trying to change the way that police are held accountable. Because this is the data that we, the, the, the data that the government collects is how we build public policy. And if we don't know something as basic as how many cops, I mean, how many uh, people are being killed by cops every year, how much else are we missing? So with that in mind, <laughs> um, do you have thoughts on like the state of social science today and data uh, generally? Yeah, yeah, so I, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, the example of tracking police killings of citizens as compared to um, our sophisticated um, collection of uh, racial crime statistics, uh, particularly black ones, it perfectly illustrates that um, data is a political choice. Data collection is a political choice. So we don't study gun violence. The CDC can't because Congress won't fund it. Uh, when the Trump administration was p pursuing a Muslim ban, it uh, established a section in the Muslim ban order for the crimes of foreign nationals uh, for the purposes of making the argument that uh, Muslim immigrants were contributing to America's crime problem because uh, we weren't tracking that data. Um, so the point, the, the kind of the broader point to you is that uh, when people like Heather McDonald lift up certain kinds of numbers, she's lifting up numbers that were themselves rooted in political choices to stigmatize or keep stigmatizing a particular group. I mean, if, if we isolated in a particular white community all the Italian-Americans, then we could make the same categorical claims about all the Italian-Americans in a particular community that didn't even have black or brown people. And then what would we do? I'll say those people are unworthy. You get the point. So I am both aware of the need for data to drive policy choices so that we can measure the problem that we seek to solve. I am also aware that um, the, the choice to pursue data is subject to um, our biases, whims, and political choices. This is animating a lot of the conversation about uh, algorithm uh, bias, uh, where our tech industry is promising to solve human bias by using algorithms to, to help us get over ourselves or get ourselves out of the way, which of course, so we can't get past that. And so as much as I think that we can help to pursue um, national policy around the proper recording of police shootings. Um, I'm not sure that that solves any particular problem as long as we're wedded to the notion of black criminality um, as, a, as a kind of core reflection of something innate to the African American community. And for me, this becomes less about data than the political choices we make. So the, you know, my, kind of my final point on this uh, is that uh, what we did for those European immigrants uh, that those settlement houses were often actually rejected data uh, 
Uh, and I write about this at length, but Jane Addams, who everyone knows as the, the archetypal social worker um, and liberal do-gooder do um, of the progressive era, um, wrote a pretty spectacular book making a case for state-based or public investment in recreation as a way to save young people from themselves. And she was deeply concerned that you know, there was uh, youth homicide um, happening in Chicago literally daily. Um, and this was not black people at all. She doesn't write about black people uh, in this book. And so her response to that was not to turn to statistics. Her, her response to that was turn to the storytelling, like the kinds that happened on Capitol Hill. Um, the kinds we hear about the opioid crisis, which don't just turn on the aggregate numbers, it turns on the actual stories of the people who suffer from these things. And so that's how Jane Addams made a case for all of this investment in the lives of, of what were then considered poor immigrant white people. And we are still deciding today whether or not various kinds of programs, whether they are nonprofit-led or government-led, are working or not based on the recidivism rate based on like, you know, are we just wasting our money? I mean, the, the whole predisposition to engaging the African American community from a structural standpoint is, well, we're just not sure this is, you know, this is money well spent. And so we need to know, rather than the assumption that if we're doing something pro-social for this community, that on its own face is a good thing to do because of what we've done to this community. Uh, and so the story of the immigrant, which I open this book with, to me is a story that moves us from the progressive era to the New Deal, to three decades of federal programs from the FHA and VA and GI benefits that essentially built America's white middle class, all predicated in some part on, we're not going to leave for you to figure this out, nor are we going to measure your crime problem. We're going to do this because this is good for our country. Um, and yet black people left holding the bag and then having to prove themselves worthy of the kind of support that white folks got. And I know we're at a libertarian think tank, and maybe you don't think all that federal intervention was a good thing. Um, that's neither here nor there from the standpoint of it did happen, and a lot of white folks benefited from it. Uh, yeah, and just a, another point on the recidivism rate. Um, there's a federal official I'm, I'm aware of who, uh, before he, he got appointed to his position, he was talking exactly the way, the way Khalil was about, oh, well, we, we have to rethink these prison programs because like the recidivism rate, it doesn't seem to affect them. It doesn't seem to affect them. So like, okay, well, um, are, what are you judging by recidivism here? Because if you're in jail for, say, murder, but you, when you go out on parole and you get drunk at a bar, you just violated parole. If you get arrested, that's, that's recidivating. You know, you didn't commit the same kind of crime. You didn't see, commit the same, uh, like, seriousness of a crime. But that's recidivating. And so we use this data, this recidivism data, which sometimes they control for parole violations. Sometimes it's okay whether or not they're, uh, you know, whether or not they're just arrested. So arrested for a separate crime. Again, um, it could be anything. It's like again, if you if you assaulted someone, but then you shoplifted because you couldn't get a job because you couldn't uh, because of your felony record, you were recidivated, right? So we really have to think more holistically about what we're doing to the people that we're counting, and what the, experience, the lived experiences of are those people. And um, I can think- I, Can I add one more yeah. thing? So, so one thing, so just to be fair, you know, this book was published in 2010 as a hardcover, 11 in paperback. It released this summer in July as a new edition. What's really new about it is a 20-page preface, which is kind of like the crib notes for all those people who are like, man, that's a good book, but man, that's really long, and the text is really small, and there's a lot of footnotes. Um, and one of the things I say, so, so I put my cards on the table in a way, in the preface, in ways that you're hearing some of it now, um, but it's not in the original uh, edition of the book. Um, also, there's no, there's no commentary on policing um, in the original uh, book. Um, uh, it's a different kind of signal uh, of what's in the book. But I want to just make one point, which I think is really important to this edition. And that is that I wrote this before Black Lives Matter, before Ferguson, before Trayvon Martin, before any of what we now um, are living and responding with. I mean, you can make an argument that Trump was elected in part on white people's reaction to Ferguson, their negative reaction to the emergence of a Blue Lives Matter moment. No one has done the empirical analysis on it, but if you talk to white nationalists, they will say, it was Ferguson that made me join this Unite the Right rally, period. Hard stop. So what I want to say about that is that um, although the critiques remain the same and the history hasn't changed, what is fascinating is that the conversation around stop and frisk, 
or the massive police contact that has been going on that has produced consent decree after consent decree after consent decree and DOJ report, both in the Obama administration and prior administrations going back more than 20 years now, all point to systemic abuse. Let's not even talk about unarmed killing. We're just talking about hands on bodies and contact. And New York, for 12 years, 4.4 million. Now, many, many people responsible for this in terms of the ideas that generated from broken windows. Uh, but one person I do write about is, um, is Bill Bratton, uh, who served in New York when Stop and Frisk was first inst instituted, then went to LA, and then came back to New York under de Blasio and only recently retired. And one of the things that this is to make a point about social science today. So CompStat was part of the technological infrastructure that gave us hotspot policing, which basically meant, well, this is where crime has happened, so let's focus on all that crime, and everywhere else the crime is not happening, well, we're not going to look because this is where the crime is. Now, some of this was reported, so it wasn't just a kind of uh, closed box. So people are calling the police and saying, hey, something has happened. But what it did was it reinforced the notion that law enforcement should be the blunt instrument of people in need, whether it was mental health, whether it was low-level uh, nonviolent criminality, whether it was drug, you know, everything. And so in the wake of the critiques of stop and frisk, the Floyd versus Patterson um, ruling in New York in 2000, uh, in, in 13 or 14, that rendered it part of it con unconstitutional, like so much else that was happening around the country. Um, Bill Bratton uh, gave a speech at the Heritage Foundation uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where he basically said, not only um, did we get it right, uh, but any notion that this crime thing has something to do with racism and discrimination and poverty, uh, and he references the Kerner, Kerner Commission report in particular, says the Kerner report was wrong. It was never about social context, political economy. It was never about discrimination. This was about behavior. And then brags about CompStat 2.0. Uh, which is promises, in his own words, uh, to not be um, prejudicial, but to be precise. Um, and so it's basically a rejection um, of any lessons we might have learned, including his own over the last 25 years, and a commitment to this notion that policing should be front and center in solving these problems. Note, when I made reference to what happened for European immigrants a long time ago, I never mentioned that the police became uh, the key ingredient uh, to helping those communities on their path to uh, a, a middle-class life in America. They didn't have a role. At, at most, you know what police uh, offered them? A job. So now we sit back here looking in 2017 when, when Braden gave the speech. And, you know, by using a big fancy academic term, there's, you know, obvious retrenchment. Um, He's doubling down on the notion that we've been getting it right the whole time, and the rest of us, whether it's Vikran's work uh, with, with the Coke Industries, or whether it's your work here, or my work, or Vera Institute, where I'm on the board, all of it, um, is all missing the point. And this is where Heather McDonald would say, you know, the Ferguson effect is going to visit your neighborhood soon, too. And the truth is, like, for me, the argument is not about, ooh, scary violence is going to rise, even though, of course, every 12-year-old who gets shot by a stray bullet is a tragedy that we should hope to avoid. But the solution to that tragedy is not to criminalize an entire community, then alienate the youth in that community and make it much more likely, or at least to be part of the problem, that a 16-year-old is going to pull, pull out a gun and shoot. We seem to have, or at least that community seems to have, no capacity to understand the criminogenic relationship to policing and incarceration in solving the very problem that they claim to want to do. Because what Bratton is saying and what others are saying, and I write about this, is that we're saving black lives and we're completing the civil rights agenda of the 21st century. But I'm sorry, I have heard few, I won't say any, I have heard few very black people saying Bratton for, for the civil rights leadership of black America. <laughs> so why it is that he thinks and those in his community think that they need to set the civil rights agenda for black America as a policing issue um, is a mystery to me. But maybe in the Q&A, you guys can help me figure it out. All right. So with that, uh, we will open it up for about, looks like, a little over 10 minutes of Q&A. Uh, we have some requests. Uh, one, wait to be called on, so uh, we'll get a microphone to you. Uh, 
and then uh, announce your name and if any affiliation that you have, if you could. Over here. Oh, and please keep it in the form of a question. Of course. Uh, Martin Moulton, DC Libertarian Party. Um, I was hoping if the author would uh, uh, clarify whether he thinks that Jews are a race instead of a, a religious group, and also, why does the author uh, avoid talking about government education when talking about incarceration rates? I think uh, you look at private education and government education, uh, Mr. Banks, W. Du Bois, my alma mater, Dartmouth, we were, uh, those institutions, private institutions, mainly white, were educating African Americans far while government schools were still making education illegal for African Americans. So the first question is, I talked about Jews the way they were talked about in the context in which I'm writing. That's how Jews were talked about. So this is not a commentary on what I think of Jews. The second is that um, I don't write about um, contemporary education as a solution to this issue. So now if you want to ask me what I think about privately funded education as a solution as compared to government schools as you describe them, then I guess I can give you an opinion. Um, at scale, um, no amount of private support is going to solve the education problems that afflict Americans in general and particularly African Americans. You know, only 40% of all Americans are reading um, at, I'm sorry, all Americans are reading at 40% grade level um, for eighth grade NAP scores. So we have an education crisis that is well beyond, and you can blame that on the government, that's fine. Um, but private, private interests are not going to solve that problem. So we've got to work with what with the systems that we have, either we build new ones. I'm not a fan of charter schools, but I'm also not, um, I'm not prepared to say that any particular charter school isn't doing a good job in any particular community. Uh, but as a pol public policy matter, we ought to take the best of whatever any particular charter school is doing and apply it at scale. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Uh, and Mr. Lowen in the back. Jim Lowen, sociologist, author of um, Sundown Towns and Lies, my teacher told me. Um, with regard to black crime statistics, um, I got involved in dealing with this in the upper Midwest. It, and it, it came up with the following amazing statistics, I think. If you look in the state of Mississippi, where I used to live, uh, black folks commit, according to the statistics, 2.5 times as much crime per capita as white folks. Now, this may be the Du Bois problem. This may be the problem they're committing to. They really are doing it. OK. On the other hand, few of us would think that Mississippi is doing a really totally equalitarian job of parceling out incarceration and you know, each step of the criminal justice pr uh, process. So maybe the two and a half is a little high. But when you look at the state of Iowa and the states that touch Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nebraska, you find that instead of being two and a half times more likely to be uh, incarcerated or in the criminal justice system, it is seven and a half, eight and a half, nine, even 10 times in those states. And since those states all touch Iowa, that must be a sociological issue. There must be some underlying causes there. And I wonder if you've ever thought about that. I, I've not seen any good work on it. I have my own speculation, and maybe you have yours. Sure. So the, uh, Ryan King, I think, is the name. Uh, the Urban Institute published a study in 2007. And they probably uh, issue follow-up reports. Um, but they basically do a national scan, and they look at disparities across every state. And what you see is northern states are at the top of the list. Southern states are near the bottom. Uh, in my own state where I live, New Jersey, uh, is among the highest in terms of disparities in incarceration. So uh, condemnation offers some of this. This has always been true from the very beginning. Northern states were overrepresenting black criminality than southern states from the very beginning. Now, um, to channel the historical arguments, um, there's two primary drivers. One is that African Americans were a few in number. And so their disparity uh, is exacerbated by the law of small numbers. Um, small, small group of people. Uh, you know, it's, it's a 
100 people and 20 of them are in trouble, that's 20% as compared to a large group of people where you have greater number but much smaller disparity. And that's true in any pie. It's hard for white people to be overrepresented um, in terms of the population. So that's one issue. The second issue is there's tremendous discrimination uh, that is happening in those places, particularly because those black communities, so you take Ferguson, for example, tend to be isolated uh, and not have the same infrastructure of accountability that is true in the South. There's political stakes, so a large a black community in either a big city as opposed to a Ferguson or a southern state as opposed to a northern state means that there's political accountability across the board. You've got black politicians who, will, who have a certain amount of cachet and platform to step in um, to make a difference in how policing happens, um, how uh, crimes are defined, um, how enforcement is, is enacted. Uh, and the other problem, I and mean, you didn't cite the time period. When did you say this happened in Mississippi? Right now, yeah, yeah. Um, so I can't speak to that. Historically, when it happened a long time ago, um, Mississippi, unlike northern cities, were desperate for black labor. And so the idea of the criminal justice system was to be coercive, not to contain them. Meaning that the idea was you want these people working in fields. You don't want them uh, behind bars or on prison camps. Um, so I can't speak for the direct lineage to that, but what I can say is places like Iowa probably don't have as much use for large black populations, even today. Um, they're struggling with you know, a farming community that is itself um, struggling, and they are relying on immigrant labor as opposed to black labor. I'm totally speculating, but you asked me to speculate. So. Uh, right here in the front. Hi, I'm Koya Wohleben. I uh, work in international development and education. Um, uh, my question is, do you think there's something to be said about kind of the French or European model of not disaggregating by racial background at all? Um, what are the disadvantages and advantages of, of that model compared to the American one? Yeah, I'm still wrestling with this. So, so one thing we know, here's what we know. We can't rewrite the past, so let's, let's just make that obvious. It, you know, we have this infrastructure, it, you know, it's hard, and it's hard to imagine that we can get rid of it. But that's not entirely an answer. So if we imagined uh, that we could get rid of it, uh, if we stopped tracking, the other thing we know is that um, that racial data, although over the course of the last 100 25 years that I've been talking about has been weaponized against black people for the most part. Um, a good chunk of it, some subset of it, has also been used to make counterclaims um, and to win legal victories uh, and to prove the point of discrimination in a problem. But I would say it's been a losing prospect for the most part. And one way to think about that in terms of we have a lot of people who do really great racial disparity work. They produce report after report after report. The sentencing project here in DC has been amazing and been you know, one of the four, at the forefront of making a lot of truth claims about the disparate impact of the criminal justice system going back to the 1990s. But it's not obvious to me that racial disparity data um, does as much liberatory work as we might think it does. It makes us feel good that we're contributing to knowledge about the problem, but it's not obvious that it's helping us do the political work to solve the problem. It's true in, in many ways that the criminal justice problem, as I define it, as some of you in this room define it, uh, is a post-civil rights phenomenon. It's not that there wasn't criminalization, as I've told in this book. It's that the problem of mass incarceration, the problem of the investment in the state and locking up as many black and brown people and ensnaring a whole bunch of white folks in the process, has been a problem since the end of the civil rights movement. So our racial disparity choice to then use that evidence to make a claim of civil rights or transformation um, becomes a catch-all of ideas between my sense of like, what does this one in three number of black and brown kids going to prison tell me? Well, it tells me we've got a problem in our criminal justice system. It tells Heather McDonald we've got a problem in the black community. And I don't think we can resolve that problem with more racial disparity data. So I don't know if then rendering invisible the evidence, one way or the other, 
leads us to some kind of racial nirvana. It certainly isn't true in France <laughs> with North Africans, and it's not true uh, in most other places. What makes Germany, which I know a little bit better because I've visited their system and talked to their criminal justice officials, and Vikram and I did this together, um, is that they have an entirely different, I mean, so they don't track. They do track foreign-born. They don't track by race. Um, but they treat everybody as uh, constitutionally protected human beings who are deserving of a fundamentally different approach to punishment and accountability than we have. So that seems to be less about what we do with our race data and more about how we treat people who we've deemed have broken the social contract. All right. And with that, it looks like we're out of time. So Can we get do one more? Oh, all right. They're going to shut you down. All right. Close your eyes and we pick. Better end up way back there. Very, very quickly. <laughs> and I promise to be brief. <laughs> I thought this clock was broken when we were talking. So, uh -oh. oh, now you're in trouble. It's four seconds. Yeah, away. yeah, I know. So my name is Cynthia Gaten. I'm here representing myself. But I had a comment because you actually brought this up with regard to artificial intelligence and algorithms. And when you're building and when you have data that's already bad, because I do research on my own. In fact, I've been doing some research on a family in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. And so Du Bois was there for the Niagara movement. Um, but uh, how do you... How should we approach, if bad data is getting into something like artificial intelligence, where the bias is already built in, how do we help prevent something like that from, from happening? Because AI is intended to run without human interference, and then we have bad data that's going into these systems. Yeah. Have you thought about how... <laughs> to deal with I, I have, and I haven't solved this problem, and, and neither are people who are, you know, literally sitting down with policymakers and judges and federal officials and trying to tinker with what goes into the algorithm. Um, probably the easiest answer in the amount of time we have is to say that it, we cannot see this to computers to solve this problem. So at, at best, I will say, um, they are algorithms are a tool, and anyone in any in any in any tech firm. Um, and any government official promising to solve this history and this current problem and the echoes of it with, a, with an algorithm or an app is lying because they don't know what they're talking about or being duplicitous because they have ill intention. And so that's the first thing is to say there are no magic solutions to this. The second is that we should insist that private firms who are building these algorithms and selling them um, should be subject to transparency agreements so that we can test precisely what's going into them in order to make sure that they meet whatever agreed upon standards um, for what kind of data is going in. And so that's a problem because these firms want their algorithms to have proprietary restrictions um, so they can sell them uh, without knowing what their quote unquote secret sauce is. And so until we can solve that problem, I think they should not be used, especially in the high stakes business of criminal justice. All right. Thank you.